Welcome to uh, service this morning. Glad to see each one of you here. And um, last week we finished off our series in the book of James, and I've been praying as to where God wants us to go uh, throughout the summer here. And um, a- after some thought and prayer and contemplation, I believe that we are supposed to go through the, the three books of John, the, the epistles of John, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. So that's where we're going to go over the next couple of weeks. So um, yeah, let's just let's pray quickly over this. Jesus, we thank you for John. We thank you that he had a witness for you, Lord, in the scriptures, and you inspired him, Lord, by the Spirit to pen uh, different things to us that we need as a church uh, today, Lord, as, as well as all the way through the years uh, that churches have been there. Lord, we just praise you and we thank you for these books, and we pray that your spirit would illuminate our hearts to what you're, you're trying to say to us, God, and we'd be able to apply everything uh, that, that is said to our lives, Lord, that you'd open our hearts to hear what you're saying. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. So I guess it's appropriate for us uh, when we're starting into a new series, into a new, uh, a, a, a new book, that um, we give a bit of a background as to where this uh, came from and, uh, and who the author is. And now, in the background to uh, the Epistle of John, there, there's been some discussion over the centuries over the identity of the person who wrote it. And um, when you look at 1 John, if you turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1, that's our text this morning, when you look at that, there is no um, identification of the author by name, but um, most scholars agree that the book of 1 John has a style of writing very similar to the Gospel of John. So then it's been surmised that this book was written to us by the Apostle John. And, um, and then in the opening paragraph, it's, it, it just seems like it blends very well with what John wrote in his Gospel. Um, also, we have uh, the first mention in extra-biblical writings. There's ancient documents that have been found uh, the first mention of John being the author was in 180 AD, so sometime after um, John, John's ministry here. But he identified this, these books as being authored by the Apostle John. And the guy's name was Irenaeus, and uh, he was actually firsthand, uh, he was firsthand uh, to the ministry. He saw the ministry of the Apostle uh, John in action. So he affirms that uh, the Apostle John is the, is, the, um, is the author. So I just wanted to give you kind of a tidbit on that. So it, the reason why this is important, folks, is because um, John had a very special calling from the Lord. And when you read the book, understanding that he is writing it, there's certain things that are brought to greater light when we read the book and the context that it was written in. So that's why I wanted to mention that. So Let's get into it. Um, John begins his letter enthusiastically and lovingly. He, after all, was the disciple that Jesus loved, the, the disciple that was closest to the Lord Jesus as the Lord walked on the earth during his ministry on the earth. Our text this morning starts with John, 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And when you look at this in context, at the end of John's ministry, before he was taken to be with the Lord, he's the only apostle, by the way, that was not martyred. John was dipped in boiling oil, and uh, so that, that marred him, and uh, he was exiled on the li- uh, island of Patmos for a lot of his, his life. But then he, we, we learned that he was released, and he became, um, he became a, a pastor, in one of the churches. So he was um, most likely the pastor in Ephesus. So John begins saying this. So he has a pastor's heart when he's saying this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life 
which was with the Father and has appeared to us. So that's the introduction to his letter. So upon reading this, these two verses, it, it, it has a very similar sound to the Gospel of John and the beginning of the Gospel of John, if you notice that, where he's talking about Jesus being the Word of life or the living Word. So to put this in perspective, okay, um, at the time Jesus came onto the scene in his earthly ministry, his earthly ministry started, we're told, when he came to the Jordan River to be baptized as an example to us by John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist at that time was, take, was telling people to repent from their sins. And, and he was baptizing them in the Jordan River as a baptism of repentance in preparation for the coming Messiah who was to come after him. And, and the Apostle John was a witness to what John the Baptist was doing, actually, what he was preaching. And, and what was John the Baptist preaching? Well, we find part of it in Matthew chapter 3, the second half of verse 2 and verse 3. John the Baptist was saying this. This is what, what part of his message was. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And we read what John the Baptist said about Jesus in verse 11 of the same chapter. He said, I baptize with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Wow. So now at some point in John the Baptist's ministry, he saw Jesus walking down towards him to be baptized. And as he saw Jesus coming down, he said to the crowds of people that were there, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And after the baptism, we see Jesus had asked John to baptize him so that all things would be in proper fulfillment. And as Jesus came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove and settled on him like a dove came upon him. And, and then there was an audible voice from heaven, from the Father God, that said, this is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. So, can you imagine being there at the Jordan River when this took place? Can you imagine that? Put yourself in the place of the people who, who saw this occur, where you see the physical presence of the Holy Spirit come down on Jesus. And you see the, and you hear the Father saying, this is my Son in whom I am well placed. You'd be pretty convinced that He was the promised Messiah, would you not? Well, in fact, among those who witnessed what occurred when this happened were none other than Andrew, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James. And Andrew and John, at the time that this occurred, were actually disciples of John the Baptist. They followed the teaching and were with John the Baptist to assist him and were learning from him. They were with him all the time. And they saw this happen. And they were convinced, in fact, that Jesus was the long-awaited Savior as well. So, they approached Jesus after this had happened. And Jesus asked them to follow him. So they left the, the discipleship of John the Baptist, and they were the first two disciples, later to become apostles, that were called to learn under Christ. Jesus had handpicked them he had planned this out. And, and the apostle, so when you, when you look at the first part of John, 1 John chapter 1, do you see it? 
John is passionate about what he's saying. Very passionate. He boldly proclaims the true nature of Jesus. Because with his own eyes, he saw the miracles take place. He saw what happened at the Jordan River. He saw Jesus Christ as he began his ministry. Turn water into wine. Open blinded eyes. Heal lepers. Command the seas to be calm. calm. He saw Jesus raise people from the dead. This is what he witnessed firsthand. He was there. He saw it. So when you read this and you consider that, when he's talking, he's not just sharing some third-party information. He is proclaiming something that he lived and he experienced. And he saw the wonder and the wisdom of the teaching of the Messiah. He saw Jesus say that he and the Father were one. And that if you saw him, you saw the Father as well. Jesus revealed himself to John and the apostles as not just a good teacher, not just a rabbi or some prophet, although he was all of those things. Jesus was not just those things. Jesus was God who had come down in the flesh. God revealed to humankind to show us what God is like with skin on. This is why he says in verse 2 that he has seen the eternal life that was with the Father and that he appeared to them at the beginning of John's gospel, in the first four verses, he said, and let's divert to the gospel of John, okay? Just keep in mind what you've read in 1 John chapter 1. Now, in the gospel of John, the gospel of John opens with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Wow. So when Jesus is called the living word, John is talking about it everywhere. He's talking about it everywhere. Even in the book of Revelation, Jesus revealed himself to John firsthand, first person, not just in his human form, but in his glorified form. And we see Jesus, not just in his earthly ministry, but in the book of Revelation, in the first part, he is, John was before him. And the Lord Jesus replied, or, or talked to him. His voice was like the sound of thundering waters. And his voice shone like the sun in all of its brilliance. And when John saw the living Lord, he fell at his feet as though dead. Because the glorified Lord that was unveiled was the very face of the Almighty in unveiled form. And you know what Jesus did when he did that? He didn't just say, now you see, John, what I am. No. He didn't do that. He came up to me. He came up to John and he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And he laid his hand on him. Because our Savior is familiar with our weaknesses. Our flesh is weak. John's flesh was weak. And the Lord gently came to him and told him what he had to tell him and and John recognized, yes, Lord, you do love me. You do care about me. So in verse 3 of First John, chapter 1, he, John continues in this theme. He says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. So when you consider what I've just spoken about as to John's first-hand experience with Jesus, 
you can, th- doesn't this carry so much more oomph? We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you may have fellowship with us. <laughs> when John was writing this, Christ had revealed everything to him about his plan for the human race, about his plan for salvation for people. He was amazed. He was still awestruck with how Jesus Christ was the Savior. He was not just the Savior. He was His Savior. And He was the herald saying, He he doesn't just have to be my Savior, but He's called you to receive Him so that not only is He our Savior, but He is your Savior too. Would you listen to the message and open your heart to hear what the Spirit has to say? So, human nature is funny though, isn't it? I don't know how many times I've read this first chapter of John in my Christian life. I can't count the number of times. But you know how it is with the Bible? Every time you read the Word of God prayerfully, submitting your heart to the Spirit, He teaches you new things. John, see, he had the facts. And I look at my own life, and maybe you look at yours, and we're so apt to doubt. We're so apt to doubt. Even when we know what the truth is, and we can even hear what the apostle is saying here, and and if our hearts aren't in the right place, it rolls over us, and we lose it. John wants to make it very clear to the church. You see, the church at this point when John was pastoring had been around for a while now. John was the last apostle to leave the world. He lived a full life. So when he's, when he's writing this letter, he's speaking to a lot of people that weren't just first-hand witnesses of the ministry of Christ. They were second-hand witnesses. They had, they were, they were, they had believed based upon what they had been told by people who were with Jesus, right? So you know how that is. Someone can tell you about something. If you haven't experienced it firsthand yourself, I mean, look at Thomas, right? When Jesus, he had told Thomas that he was going to rise from the dead. He told him that very clearly. The Passover supper, that was all revealed that he was going to be betrayed and handed into handed to the sinners. And yet, when Jesus rose from the dead, right, the other disciples, the other, the other disciples were saying, Thomas, we've seen him. And he's like, I won't believe. I won't believe unless I can put my hand here and touch. I will not believe. Isn't human nature like that? Folks, sometimes when we read the Bible, we read it through human nature. We need to read the, the Scriptures prayerfully, humbly, bowing our heart before the authority of God, realizing that this Word of God that we have is not just something hearsay. It's not just some pious legend. Jesus isn't just some pious legend off in the distance there. He is God. And when you read the Word of God I would encourage you, open your heart to the Holy Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to make the Word of God come alive in you. And, and, and He will. You see, the Lord promises that if you ask Him for fish, He's not going to give you a snake. If you ask Him for bread, He's not going to give you a stone. He wants to give you the richness of the inheritance in the saints. And part of that richness is the very word spoken to us through the Scriptures. It is a holy word. It is a revelatory word. It shows us what God is like and what God's plan is for us. But like Thomas, sometimes we falter, we doubt, and we carry on with our daily living almost as if Jesus never really was who He said He is. But Jesus, Jesus Christ, John's saying this, Jesus was from eternity. 
He came from the Father into the world as necessary, essential, uncreated life. That's why it calls him the life. No other being on the planet or in existence could pay for the sins of humanity. Only a pure, blameless God-man could accomplish what Jesus accomplished in redeeming a lost humanity and bringing us as a human race back to Himself. Jesus came as God manifested in the human flesh. The eternal life, John calls Him, the eternal life, put on human flesh and came to dwell amongst us and to converse with us. Isn't that amazing? It's wonderful. The message John was so eagerly proclaiming here is what we call the gospel. We call this the gospel. What is the gospel in a sentence? Well, the gospel is the good news to man about God. That's what it means. The gospel is the living word of God. See? That's part that's that's the essence of the good news. The gospel is the living word of God given to us. The gospel is the living word of the kingdom of God. Announcing the kingship of God over the universe and that obedience to the word of God makes someone a citizen of that kingdom. The gospel is the living word of grace revealing the generous understanding, the forgiving and loving character of God who willingly grants His favor to sinners who don't deserve it, yet He freely gives it. The gospel is the living word of salvation. The offer of forgiveness for past sins and also the power, the promise of power to help us overcome sin in the future. It is the Word. It is the living Word of reconciliation. Lost relationship between God and humanity is restored in Jesus Christ. The gospel is the living word of the cross where God in all of his glory because of his great love for us and his desire not to see us perish but all of us to come to repentance and come to the knowledge of him and come to him and become his child, his child because of this. The living word of the cross, the creator and sustainer of all things humbled himself when he didn't have to humble himself. He's the creator. He could have done anything he wanted, but he humbled himself willingly and became obedient to death on a cross. The creator did this. He sacrificed himself for our benefit by permitting his own creation to mistreat him. In order to save this world, Jesus suffered and died a cruel death on the cross in our stead, in our place to pay for our sins at very great cost. Sometimes we, we trivialize, we get so used to hearing the Christian message, we trivialize, trivialize Jesus as though he's some sort of cardboard cutout or a picture on the wall in a Sunday school classroom or something like that. We trivialize him. No, Jesus Christ in Revelation is the, the God of, of the universe, the one and only true God who reigns forever. That at the name of Jesus, every name shall, shall confess Him as Lord. And every knee will fall down before Him. Even the ones in this world who proclaim that He is dead, that He is not even, in a, uh, that he is not even a God. He's, not, he's nothing. Those people will bow down their knee to Him and will fall prostrate when they see Him. And then they'll have to face judgment. We're not talking a cardboard cutout or something posted on your Sunday school board when you're a kid that you remember Jesus, you know, a picture of him. No, no. 
Yes, that reminds us of who he is because those stories connect in visually in our mind. But we, we sell him short. He's the creator. If he was to appear in bodily form right here, not a single one of you would be sitting in your seat right now. Guaranteed. We'd be falling on our face right now before him. Wow. John's seen this. In his epistle... Or in, sorry, in the gospel, John says, for from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. Isn't that interesting? The fullness of God results re being revealed and receiving the, the fullness of God. We receive grace upon grace. It's just like God puts his hand on us like he put his hand on John when he revealed himself to John. Blessed are you who believe, yet do not see. That's what Jesus told Thomas. We are the benefactors. We are the receivers of that message. Blessed are you when you receive the Lord by faith, by trusting in Him, by hearing the Word and believing in the Word that God has given. For from, from His fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made Him known. See, there was, there was a time during the earthly ministry of Jesus where He was confronted by some people who were trying to entrap Him. There was people that were trying to trap Him. What did they do? In this particular case, they brought before him a woman. A woman who had been caught committing adultery in the very act of it. And those who brought the woman to where Jesus was advised the Lord smugly that the law of Moses demanded she be put to death by stoning. What did Jesus do? But Jesus said to the ones who had brought her to him, let he who has never sinned be the one to cast the first stone. And one by one, all of the women's accusers, from the old, starting with the oldest, left because they realized that not one of them could say that they were not a sinner. And finally, the woman was left alone, standing with Jesus. And as recorded in the Gospel of John 8, 10 to 12, Jesus said, he st Jesus stood up to her and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She says, No one, Lord. And Jesus says, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Friends, Jesus Christ came to be the light of the world. He came to be the Savior of sinners. The call goes out, O oh sinners, would you come? Would you come and receive my grace and forgiveness? Would you receive the sacrifice that I have made for you? Because I did it instead of you. You don't have to die because of your sin. You can receive forgiveness through me. And when we repent of our sins, believe in him, and commit to following him, the Holy Spirit of God enters our spirit. This is beautiful. And dispels the darkness, bringing light into our spirits. And we're no longer bound because of this as slaves to sin. We have become the slaves of righteousness. Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Would you come? We are children of righteousness, children of the light, born again in the Spirit. We're called now to obey God out of love and gratefulness for what He has done for us in realization of who He is. 
The Apostle Peter agrees with John when he speaks of Jesus. In 1 Peter chapter 2.24, we read this. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. And the Apostle Paul adds to the same message that John the Apostle is saying here and Peter the Apostle is saying here in Ephesians chapter 5, 8 to 16. And he says this, For you were once in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of the light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. But everything is exposed by the light. Everything exposed by the light becomes visible. And everything that is illuminated becomes a light. And that's why Christ is said, Wake up, sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. You see that? Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine from you. Be born again in the Spirit. Christ will shine on you. That's what he's saying. Be very careful then how you live, not as the unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. We know it's dark out there. There's wickedness all around us. But you, you have been called to be children of the light and to walk in obedience to the Lord. And he's given you full provision to be an overcomer and to walk in obedience with him. This is the good news of the gospel. You see, John emphasizes this in his text this morning when he instructs the church saying, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. You see, as believers, if we're true believers in Jesus, if we actually believe, there ought to be a difference in the way that we operate. Shouldn't there be? There ought to be a difference. There's new ownership over this house that we are. New ownership. True believers are no longer slaves to sin. If there's no repentance from sin accompanied by our confession of Jesus as Savior, then we've swallowed the wrong thing. You see, when you believe, it is accompanied by repentance. Repentance means observing the fact that you're a sinner and turning opposite direction and abandoning your life of sin and casting yourself at God and saying, God, have mercy. Fill me. Show me the way. Help me to walk in a way that is pleasing to you. That is Christianity in its New Testament context. Then the Spirit of God comes in and lives in you. Are you truly a believer in Christ? Or did you just pray a prayer sometime in the past? Has it done any difference in your, the way that you carry yourself and the way that you live your life? If it hasn't, and I can't answer this question, you have to answer this question. If it has not made a difference, I have to ask myself whether I truly actually became a believer. Am I truly saved then? If there's no fruit and I'm walking in the darkness and my life is characterized by darkness, how great is that darkness? It doesn't have to end this way. If you're hearing this message today and you've prayed a prayer or you've crossed your chest or whatever you've done religiously, God is calling you to repentance this morning. He's calling you to give he, your life to Him because He is the eternal life. And when the eternal life is your Lord and Savior, the light of Christ comes in, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit enters in, and you now become raised from the dead, and you become a light in this world. And your light shines to men, and they see your good works, and they glorify your Father in heaven. That's that's what the scripture says, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You're called to good works, not out of legalism. That's not what we're talking about. Out of love for Christ, out of the recognition of that the great I am, the creator of the universe, has come to you. He's so macro powerful. 
He controls the, the whole universe and he set everything into motion and he s- sustains everything by his powerful hand. He sustains it all, but yet he's so micro that he knows about Clint Lang and all the little things about who I am. He knows my goodness. He knows my weaknesses. He knows everything about me. He knows where I'm broken and I need healing. And he calls me by name because he loves me. And he loves you too the same way. He sees everything about you and he called you. Why? Because he loves you. He wants you to know him and the power of his resurrection. This is why John continues saying in verse 7 of our text, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Living in the light, what does it mean? It means living under the influence of the indwelling Holy Spirit. And when we live in the indwelling power of the Spirit, the evidence in our lives manifests as fruit manifests on the branches of a tree. It manifests as love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As a believer, when we're obedient to Christ, and as a result, operating in this kind of realm, the result is this. We will form and we will maintain good relationships with other people. You know, a unified church, unified in the gospel, loving one another, and, and displaying the fruit of the Spirit is a powerful church. It's a powerful church. That's the New Testament church that John is encouraging people to, to see. That's what God designed. That's what He wants. But we all know, right, As a believer, we all know that Christians aren't perfect. Any perfect people here? No. We're not perfect. God knows it. And so so does John. But there's a scripture that says, be perfect as I am perfect. And that's talking about the fact that we ought to, out of love for Christ, strive to be the people of God to be the righteous people, the holy people, the people that shine His light into the darkness. Why? Because we love the people of this world. We don't want to see them go to hell in a handbasket like they are. We don't want to see them die. What does it do to our hearts when we, when we consider the people in our families and our friends that are walking around us blind to spiritual things, operating in the flesh, pursuing their passions and, and, and having gods of this world as their master instead of Jesus. Does it break our heart like it breaks God's? You've been called, my friends. If you're a believer in Christ, you've been called to be the light of the world. The light shines in the darkness. And sometimes the darkness doesn't understand it, does it? didn't understand the Lord, and it's not necessarily going to understand you either. There's going to be people who think that you're... you're You're telling them about Jesus because you got an agenda. You're trying to get another point with God in heaven. Right? You're trying to manipulate them. You're trying to bring them to a place where they really don't want to be. No. When the love of Christ flows through us, when we talk to people, we shine the light of God's character in how we behave, in what we say. And that... That, my friends, is a witness. It's not just by what we do. There's lots of people that keep biblical morals in their own strength, but they have sinful things in the backdrop, right? They have sinful reasons for that. Maybe they want to look good. They want to be considered a good person in this world. Uh, someone that helps us. You know, I help those people. I'm generous. You know? now, God wants us to simply be the light because we love because we love our brothers and sisters in the church, because we care about the people that are lost, that need Jesus as their Savior. So, being human, we don't always get this right, do we? I'm a failure abysmally sometimes. 
And I have to pick up and look in the mirror and go, God, have mercy. I really have so far to go. Would you show me the way? You see, because despite the fact that we have this new born-again nature and we're no longer slaves to sin, we still carry the old nature with us. And sometimes we allow the temptations of this world to cloud out the call of God to be obedient to Him, and we fall. And this is why John says in verses 8 to 10, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. I need to grow spiritually still while I'm here. I pray that you understand that too. We haven't arrived. Just because we're believers and maybe we have a love and passion for God doesn't mean we've arrived. There's room for spiritual growth. And that means there's room for change, room for understanding that I don't always get things right. Sometimes I have to switch gears, rework things in, in my mind and in my spirit. I need to work things and submit to the Word of God in areas that maybe I have never been receiving the revelation of till maybe now maybe another time maybe you're in your devotions and you're reading the scriptures and god puts something down in your heart don't ignore that don't ignore it grow in the lord humble yourself before the lord if we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us that's called spiritual pride when i think i'm pretty good i got it made all the other people ought to watch and see how i'm doing you know like that's that's not right We need to walk humbly before our God, understanding our brokenness and weakness and how without Him, if we don't walk in His power, we're going to fail, we're going to fall, we're going to make mistakes, we're going to make bad decisions. But the good news is this. John says this, he says, not just to leave us hanging and say, yeah, you're going to be struggling with sins. He says, if we confess our sins, in verse 9, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, he says it again, we make him out to be a liar and the word is not in us. Because you know what? If we're self-righteous, we're basically saying that I'm my own savior. That's what the Pharisees did. They were really religious. They were religious people down to their very shoelaces but they were very far from God. Their hearts were hard because they approached God as if though they were good enough. I'm not like those other guys down the street who do those terrible things. I live a good life. I take care of my neighbor. I cut their lawn. I do whatever. I, I'm good. In God's eyes, our righteousness is what? Like filthy rags. Even the things that we do. We're not good enough. We need the grace of God to live, to grow. So if we confess our sins, maybe your sins are in attitude. Maybe your sins are in motivation of why you do things. Let the light of the Word of God shine on you. And when you hear the voice of the Spirit calling out to your heart, don't ignore it. Humbly come before the Lord and say, God, change my heart. Make me more like you, Lord. I am the the clay. You are the potter. To wrap this up, maybe you as a believer need need to get back into harmony with your relationship with God. Maybe you've wandered. Maybe your love has grown cold. You've been drifting for a while and you've been falling into patterns of behavior that are not pleasing to the Lord. And if this is the case and you're some what or completely prodigal in your heart, gone away from your home, gone away from your Father, living your life as you please. Jesus is calling you to lay it all down, to come down, come before Him, to ask for forgiveness, to repent. See, repentance is not only for the unsaved. Repentance is for the believer too. If you're, if you're, if you find that you've sinned. He is faithful and just to forgive you from all your, all your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But this takes a contrite heart before God and a willingness to change and a willingness to turn. If this is the case, this morning God's calling you to lay it down. Ask the Lord for forgiveness. We're going to be going into communion in a few minutes. This is the time right now to check our hearts 
and see where we are with Christ. Have I lost my first love for Him? Have I grown cold in my heart? Have I drifted? Lord, draw me near. Help me to forgive the people that hurt me, just as you forgave me when I hurt you. Lord, if I have things in my life and you know about it and I just want to be open to you, Lord. Show me. Show me the things that you want me to to give to you. I love you, Lord. Pray that prayer. And maybe this morning, if you're honest with everything, you have never really ever been truly following Jesus. Maybe you prayed a prayer one time, but you never surrendered. You've never known the power of the gospel, the resurrection power of Christ in your life, and you're walking around incomplete. Well, if you're walking around this way, religion is not going to make it better. Only a relationship with Jesus and the indwelling spirit of God that he will give to you will be the the game changer for you. Now is the day. Today is the day of salvation for you. If you've never taken a step of true faith and said, Jesus, I give you my life. Everything that I have, O Lord, is yours. Everything that I am, O Lord, is yours. Take my life, Lord, and do what you will with it. But help me to be obedient and help me to hear your voice and be obedient, Lord. Maybe it's time to repent of the sins that are entangling you and say, I'm going to push away from this because they're destroying me. If you truly surrender to Jesus Christ this morning, I promise you this one thing. You will never be the same. Never. You will be changed instantly. You can't come into the presence of God and be filled with His Spirit and remain the same. If you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you are not His. You are still walking in darkness. But if you come to the Lord and you humble yourself before Him, and you, you acknowledge the fact that you can't do this on your own, and you ask Him to be your Lord and Savior, take my sin upon your shoulders, you died instead of me, Lord. I, I now believe. And you take that belief, and you say, Lord, I can't even believe without you helping me. I take you, Lord, into my heart, and it's not something that I can do. Change me, Lord. Change me. This is the call. You see what I'm saying? It's not about you. You can't do this on your own. You need the Spirit of God to help you to do anything that you do. For by grace are you saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast about it. Why? Because it's free. We're all sinners, and we all need the same thing. We need God's grace. Amen. So, this morning, if you truly surrender, you'll you'll change. It doesn't mean that you're never going to mess up and sin. But your sinful ambitions and your sinful life no longer is going to be the controlling factor in everything that you do. You'll be filled with the light of the Holy Spirit. If this is you this morning, I want to pray with you. Or maybe you're you're here today with someone that you have a relationship with and you know they walk with Jesus. I would encourage you, Come pray with me or go pray to that, with that person and, and, and acknowledge that you need Jesus. Now is the day. Today is the day of salvation. You might not have tomorrow. Tomorrow has no guarantees, friends. Your life might be taken away just like that and you have to face God. There is no guarantees. Now we're going to enter a time of communion. If you've been drifting, or if you've been holding on to something that's not right, whether it's animosity towards someone that you haven't forgiven, whether it's some secret sin you're, you're sliding into and trying to overcome on your own, there is one who is faithful and just to forgive you this morning, cleanse you, and draw you near. You see, you're still a child of God, but he wants you to be close to him. Your sin, the, your drifting, makes you distant with him. 
God's calling his church to be close to him. Would you be close to the Lord? Would you surrender those things that maybe you need to? Communion is a holy time. I'm going to ask the, the men or people that have been asked to help with communion to come forward, if you would. I know Tim asked for last week, and then it was to be this week. Is there people that, have, that are here this morning that were asked to be part of that? Okay, I'm just going to ask you guys to come forward. Yeah. This is a time where we remember, we remember the reason for the sacrifice of the Lord. It's His blood that cleanses us. Fellows, come on up. It's His blood that gives us life. The atoning sacrifice for our sins was given in Christ. And Jesus, he said um, at the Passover with his disciples before he went to his crucifixion, he says, I want you to do this in remembrance of me. The blood is represented by the fruit of the vine. The broken body of the Lord is represented by the bread. It's important that we don't take communion if we're not believers. If we take this in an unholy way, we bring condemnation on ourselves. It's a very serious thing to participate in communion without having our hearts right before God. We're called to examine ourselves. The Bible says that some of you even are sick and some have even fallen asleep because they've taken communion without recognizing the broken body and blood of Christ and what it means. So as the elements go around, believers, even if you're visiting here, if you're from another assembly or from out of town, you're welcome to join us if you're part of the family of believers that is born again. I'm going to ask that the men distribute the emblems right now. Go ahead. So as these emblems are going around, I think it's good for us to reflect. Lord, you see our heart. You see the things that have made us stumble, Lord. Father, maybe there's things in our lives that We need to surrender and we need to return to our first love. This morning, if that's you, you can give them those things up to Jesus this morning and and participate with communion. I'm just going to take a moment in silence just to remember the broken body and blood of Christ that was shed for us.
So when Jesus was with his disciples, he, um, he said to them while he's eating the Passover meal with them, he said that this was his body that was broken for us. And Lord, we thank you for the broken body that you gave on Calvary for us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that by your stripes we've been healed. You willingly, as the creator of the world, subjected yourself to beating and being broken so that we could have life. And Lord, we know that this came at a tremendous cost to yourself being the king, subjecting yourself to humility and humbling yourself and becoming, becoming obedient to death on the cross. Lord, we don't, we don't want to forget who it is that secured us with you. And it's all about you, Jesus. So this morning, Lord, we pray that as we participate in this ceremony and remembrance of you, that we would remember your broken body, Lord, and Father, that as we partake, God, that you would be honored. Let us partake of this now, in Jesus' name. And after Jesus had given them bread, he took a cup, fruit of the vine, and he said, this is my blood. It's been poured out, which is going to be poured out for you, which is poured out for you. The blood of Jesus was innocent blood. Everything about the Lord was holy. He was human like us, yet without sin. The sinless Lamb of God. The sacrificial Lamb that took our place, that paid the penalty of sin, which is death. He took the death penalty upon Himself so that we would have life, so that we could have forgiveness and reconciliation to Him. He is the eternal life. He's overcome sin in the grave. He's overcome it all. And He paid the full price for us to follow. He's the first fruit of the resurrection. And we are His children. And Lord, we thank You this morning that You call us Your children. Lord, by Your grace, You've brought us into Your family. And we recognize that without your shed blood, Lord, that none of this would be possible. So, Lord, we remember you today as we, we partake in this communion ceremony. We remember you and the blood that was shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for your innocent blood which took our place. Thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice. We honor you this morning in Jesus' name. Let us partake of the cup together. Amen. Amen. This morning, we're just going to close in prayer here and then close in a song. Lord Jesus, you are our King. Thank you, God, for what you've done. Father, if there's people here today that need to receive you as Savior, I pray that they would not delay, that their hearts would receive you. If there's people listening online, the same. God, and for those of us who are believers, and yet we're stumbling, God, we just give you everything and we ask that you'd help us to live a life that is pleasing to you because we love you, Lord. We pray that you'd be honored and glorified as we go this week. In Jesus' name, amen. May God's grace and peace rest on you. And I pray that you'd have a good week. Would you stand this morning as we close in song?